So, NVIDIA's Ampere graphics cards for gaming have finally been unveiled to the entire world for everybody to see. And it looks like it's gonna be a really, really busy season for all of us. As always, I was expecting Jensen to show up in his fancy leather jacket, and sure he did. Uh, in fact, I am really interested to pick one up for myself. But besides the point, um, he did walk us through the architecture behind Ampere and what that's gonna be powering. In fact, we're getting three graphics cards, the RTX 3090, the RTX 3080, and the RTX 3070. This is all gonna be part of NVIDIA's current GPU lineup for the foreseeable future. So that means new car designs, new power connectors, the specs are just crazy, the pricing has also been unveiled, and some new interesting features as well. So we're gonna break it down into this video as much as we can right after this. Say hello to proper airflow with Be Quiet Pure Base 500DX, a compact mid tower with a mesh front panel and three 140mm Pure Wings 2 fans that are silent and capable. Enjoy tasteful ARGB illumination, a Type C port, and an easy case to work in. Check it out below. All right, so let's start off with the specs. And from an overall perspective, Nvidia essentially took the Turing architecture and then optimized its design from the ground up and then supersized it. So now you're getting more cores higher memory speeds, uh, some new RTX features, and some eye-watering prices as well. Meanwhile, everything operates at higher efficiency, but even when combined with a new manufacturing process, they're supposed to consume a lot of power, and that means tons of heat. Now, we can't get into the underlying architecture right now, but it seems like NVIDIA has made some fundamental changes to the CUDA cores. So while in some cases you'll see a doubling in CUDA cores, it won't necessarily mean that you're gonna get double the theoretical performance. We'll cover that a little bit later when the NDAs are up. So let's start at the very top, and that's the RTX 3090 flagship, which is meant to be a Titan RTX replacement. It's got 10,496 CUDA cores, 24 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory operating at 19 gigabits per second, and it's rated at a massive 350 watts. The power consumption isn't unheard of since AMD's RX Vega liquid-cooled edition ate up about 345 watts, but it's still a huge jump from the 280-watt Titan. And then there's the price. Yeah, asking $1,500 for a single graphics card might sound nuts, but you can't forget, NVIDIA sold almost every $1,200 RTX 2080 Ti they could make, and the Titan RTX Ultimate was about $2,500. So yes, there's certainly a market out there for uber-expensive GPUs, but there's also the RTX 3080, which steps things down a bit. This GPU is supposed to be putting a beating on the RTX 2080 Ti due to the new architecture, faster memory, and other optimizations. It has 8,704 cores, 10 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory, running at 19 gigabits per second, and a board power of 320 watts. So that's a lot more power than the 2080 Ti, less memory, and a narrower interface, but still more bandwidth due to the overall memory speed. And pricing for this? Well, it's actually not that bad at $700. If you take into account, you're supposed to be getting better than 2080 Ti level performance. This might be an interesting option for someone who's still rocking a GTX 1080 Ti or 1080, but we'll have to see how it performs in actual gaming. When compared to the RTX 2080 Super, which was also launched for $700, well, there's just no comparison. You get more cores, more memory, a wider interface, faster memory, the list just goes on. But that power consumption is actually pretty brutal. The RTX 3080 and RTX 3090 will be available on September the 17th, technically. Now, Nvidia is really turning things on their heads with these new cards cooler designs. I mean, of course, the RTX 3090 will produce tons of heat, and Nvidia didn't want to make use of a clunky liquid cooler design like AMD did with the RX Vega 64. So this isn't a small change in any way. It's a big shift in how cooling is handled, but it also raises some concerns about case design and temperatures of other components. What they did is use computer modeling to see what the perfect airflow design would be for the GPU and found that the current examples weren't efficient. So everything from the ground up was modified. The PCB, fans, heatsink, and even the software that controls fan speeds needed to be studied. And the end result is something very, very different, and it's massive. Instead of the downdraft style dual fan layout that traps hot air in a narrow space between the PCB and the fans, this new cooler design opens things up a lot. Each of the fans have a dedicated heatsink and heat pipes while the PCB is sandwiched in between. The fans are still designed to suck air from the enclosure's bottom, but there's a twist. 
there's now a single fan placed within the back plate that pushes cool air upwards through the heatsink and on towards the top of the case. Then there's another fan drawing in air from near the case's back and then that's pushed into a different fin array and then exhausted outside the case. The cooling design is a massive piece of engineering, but there's different sizes for the 3090 and 3080. The 3090 takes up three slots and it's 12.3 inches long while being a beefy 5.4 inches wide. The 3080, on the other hand, is a double slot and only 11.2 inches long and 4.4 inches wide, which makes it smaller than the RTX 2080 Founders Edition. Now, this is where I need to express some of my concerns with this design. I hate the fact that hot air is being pushed towards the CPU area because that's definitely going to affect the VRMs and, of course, processor temperatures. So you'll definitely need amazing airflow to make this thing work. Otherwise, it's going to affect the rest of the system components. It's also obvious that these cards are engineered to be installed in the standard horizontal orientation uh, instead of mounting it vertically because if you install the 3090 vertically, one of the air intake fans is going to be it's going to be so closer to the side window which is going to be a choking hazard and then you have the other fan that's just blasting hot air to the motherboard so now you just create you just created yourself a hot zone between the side window the gpu and of course the rest of the components it's just not optimal at least from the way how you look at things but Again, it'll be really interesting to see and test out different configurations with this new design. I'm really curious to get my hands on this and just run a bunch of tests, so definitely stay tuned for that. The RTX 3070 was also announced, and even this GPU is supposed to outperform the RTX 2080 Ti, though I assume that's with ray tracing and other RTX-specific features enabled. But on paper, its specs are actually pretty close to the RTX 2070 Super, though it has more cores, same amount of memory, type, and a 256-bit interface. And although NVIDIA didn't say what the actual memory speed it could be, I'm hoping it's 16 gigabits per second. It's also a pretty compact card at just 9.5 inches, and it has a very typical downdraft cooler design since NVIDIA didn't need something high-end to cool this thing. The price is still $500, like the Super, but based on this, I really have to wonder about limiting it to 8 gigabytes of memory. Another thing NVIDIA did is completely redesign the power connector in order to save space and increase the potential input current while also optimizing for clean power delivery. The dual 8-pin connectors are gone, and in their place is a single super compact 12-pin that's placed at midpoints of all cards. Now, I'm not sure if there are any power supplies in the market that offer 12-pin cables, uh, but it looks like NVIDIA will be offering dual 8-pin to 12-pin adapters with some of these cards. Another thing I noticed is that the specs still list DisplayPort 1.4a instead of the newer 2.0 spec. That means it'll be limited to 8K 60Hz or 4K 120, even when using display stream compression. We've already encountered limitations on some current monitors, so this isn't great news for future monitors. On the other hand, NVIDIA has added HDMI 2.1, which technically offers all the way up to 10K 100 hertz or 120 hertz. So does this mean NVIDIA is focusing on HDMI going forward? Who knows? But what about performance? Well, with these type of presentations, they only show a select number of benchmarks. And again, like I said, this one wasn't any different. Because of the optimizations in the Tensor and RT cores, there's going to be a really large performance improvement in situations that involve ray tracing and AI. That's understandable since one of the major issues with first generation GPUs was how much games bogged down when NVIDIA's super hyped features were turned on. The last thing I want to talk about is RTX IO, and it could be a game changer if developers decide to utilize it. It aims to speed up the GPU's access to compressed game data by bypassing the CPU for decompression. Basically, PCI Gen 4 SSDs can feed information to the system faster than most current processors can handle. So finding a way around that bottleneck is pretty critical for optimal performance in next-gen games, and this could also be a big deal for lowering CPU requirements in the future, of course. So that pretty much wraps this up for the time being. Obviously, there's still a lot more questions that still need to be answered. In fact, as we were watching the presentation, we raised a lot more questions than getting answers. So there will be answers very soon, but until then, exciting stuff from NVIDIA. Uh, I'm really curious to get my hands on them. And of course, we're gonna have a lot more content with the new Ampere graphics cards. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one.